you know, we, we, we also have a young secretary and secretary Buttigieg might be somebody who wants to leave a legacy. You know, he's of a different generation than, than most secretaries. And if he's somebody who wants to leave a legacy, that's somebody we we got something you could leave a legacy on. You want to you want to devalue <laughs> hours of service and really focus on the root of the problem, and that's well trained drivers, safe drivers. Let's talk, buddy. Let's talk because that's where the real problems at. And, and self insured companies, like let's talk about that. Hey everybody, it's Todd Dills here, your host for this edition of Overdrive Radio, featuring a long discussion with Trucker Nation Director of Communications, Andrea Marks. No stranger to the regulatory process or the ins and outs of running a small trucking business. She has livestock haulers and her family's small fleet. She was talking at the top about what she sees as a golden opportunity for hours of service flexibility advocates lying in plain view in the form of the COVID-19 emergency declaration waiving regs for emergency relief haulers of particular commodities since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. There's not just opportunity therein, though, but danger, given the September 1st changes to the emergency waiver that seem designed to some watchers, including Marx, to discourage use of the exemption and give regulators a way to control the narrative around its use in the event of a serious challenge to the efficacy of the hours of service rule itself. A lot, of course, depends on how many carriers are running under the exemption and how often. The question we've been asking at Overdrive this week. If you haven't weighed in on your use of the COVID exemption as yet, find the poll embedded in the post that houses this podcast on September 16th at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. My talk with Marks brought several other questions to mind that I put directly to FMCSA. I've been promised responses to those questions at some point in the day Friday, September 16th, or at the latest early next week, so check that post that houses this podcast for that day for any answers received. Those questions were, number one, what is the reasoning behind shifting the COVID-19 emergency declaration and its waiver to exempting only the drive time limits to the hours of service, and not the other regulations previously exempted? Two. With regard to the reporting requirement or ask of carriers, is it really a requirement or merely a voluntary ask? Three, what information exactly is being asked of carriers to report? Will FMCSA be requesting number of trips, specific logs of trips, or merely attestation that the declaration was relied on, period? Four, and partially speaking to Mark's point at the top, has the agency considered examining crash rates of carriers who've used the declarations to date extensively versus other carriers who haven't. Broadly, at least to me, it doesn't appear truck-involved crashes have been on the rise over the pandemic period. Plenty advocates see such an examination as a possible way to evaluate the safety effectiveness of the hours of service writ large, which I'll admit I did think of from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic myself. So many factors figure into crash rates, though, it could be a heavy lift without a hard analysis and or investigation of a large number of individual cases. Marx herself has some answers of her own to those questions and plenty of opinions about the recent changes. But before I hand it off to her to start with a rundown of all that changed about the COVID waiver on September 1st, here's a brief message from Overdrive Radio's sponsors. First Guard provides commercial truck insurance to leased owner operators done right. As we've done for more than 80 years, we provide physical damage and non-trucking. Many companies make you pay up to six months of insurance premiums up front, but not First Guard. We bill monthly, so you get quality insurance without needing to pay a lot of cash up front. Go to firstguard.com. That's one S T guard.com. First Guard. We speak trucker. Let's talk. Synchrony Car Care is a robust program built for your business and your customers. We offer drivers a way to pay for the services and parts they need today, but there's so much more to Synchrony Car Care. We treat your customers as an extension of your brand, and we don't take it lightly. We're committed to a simple application and fair terms. Let us help drive traffic and drive success for your business.
there's some huge differences and then there are some small nuanced differences but they are they make significant impacts so uh well i'll let's break them all down so okay. the humongous di- uh humongous differences are every single iteration of or version if you will of this um declaration from march of 2020 until now uh, motor carriers and drivers have been exempt from parts 390 to 399 of the federal motor carrier safety regulations that included not only a waiver of the hours of service drive time limits but a full gamut of vehicle regulations motor carrier related regs and some driver qualifications as well when this version came out on September 1st, motor carriers and drivers are exempt from one single sub regulation. So they are, uh, motor carriers and drivers are now exempt from 49 CFR 395.3, and that's it. So they went from being exempt from a wide range of regulations while operating under this declaration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to being exempt from a singular subpart of the regulations. Right. And that's humongous, like one of the most significant changes. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of reasons why that may have happened, and I think we can get into that uh, a little later in the conversation. I have a lot of opinions about why this has happened. Um, again, just opinions, but I've got a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the most significant changes. So 49 CFR uh, 395.3 is um, maximum drive time for property carrying vehicles. So that includes, you know, the 14 hour clock requirement for the 30 minute break, 11 hour drive time, um, you know, 14 hour total on duty time for the day, the 10 hour break requirement, 34 hour restart, 70 hour uh, work week. So um, that's huge. But that also means that anyone who has been using this declaration um, for the past, what, 19 months, um, right. also now has to go back to logging, um, where they previously have been using the declaration and not been required to log. Right. Which creates the, um, uh, uh, cre- creates the, the record of, you know, the amount of, of time driven and, and, uh, Correct. It, and gives gives the agency the ability to um, potentially, anyways, uh, study that um, if they have access yeah. to those records. I mean, so I've 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 been in direct contact with Joe. Uh, Marks is referring there to Joe DiLorenzo, longtime FMCSA enforcement chief, from whom you've heard on this podcast before. Marks asked about the plan study and the reporting requirement including just what information will be asked of motor carriers in order, presumably, to help conduct the study. The study that they will be doing is just about reliance on um, on the declaration. Um, the information that will be required will simply, simply be the number of trips and the types of commodities being um, transported. The <laughs> data will simply be used for informational purposes. Sure. So... Um, they're not going to be asking for records. The only time I think records will come into play would be during a, a compliance audit. And, and roadside stops, uh, theoretically, right? Well, and roadside stops. So um, so that is one of the biggest changes, is one, that um, the only being exempt from one singular part of the, or subpart of the regulations, yep. um, being required to go back to logging. Um, there were changes in the um, the list of commodities. So there are seven commodities listed now, um, where previously I think there was only five. So uh, gas, 
um, diesel, jet fuel, ethyl alcohol, things like that. Right. Um, that stuff is, is added back in. Um, and then there was a statement um, added back in um, to, to be eligible for the exemption. The transportation must be both, one, a qualifying commodity, and two, incident to the immediate restoration of those essential supplies. Um, so who, who's the one that determines that? FMCSA has never been able to give us a clear answer. Um, I have asked that question countless times over the past 19 months, and I have got a different answer most every time. Um, right. I've, I've and, run into that as well, just talking with uh, various and sundry of the, of the state um, state officers and, and what have you. And um, yep. yeah, I mean, the most, most kind of fall back on a, um, like there's no single party that makes that determination. It's, it's just basically uh, like the reality of, of the situation. And, you know, and that could include yep. whether the, whether the shipper and or the receiver or both of them, or one of them or and the carrier all are on the same page that this is uh, an emergency load right. or not or yeah it's, it's, it's kind of across the board in a lot of a lot of respects i know and i have got um differing answers from fmcsa when i have asked so right. um i i have got that it's the you know shipper's responsibility it's the receiver's responsibility it's the uh, carrier's responsibility to ask those questions yeah. the driver should know and i have pushed back as hard as i can on that one i said it is absolutely not the driver's responsibility to know a store's stock whether or not that's uh an emergency or not i said the driver has one responsibility and that uh, two responsibilities excuse me I said that is to get whatever freight he or she is hauling to uh, from one point to another and to get it there safely. That's it. That's it. They, they don't need to justify themselves or be having these kind of, in, these kind of um, conversations at roadside to justify what they're doing. No, 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 no. Especially when they have, you know, this frequently asked question do document that specifically says that no documentation is required to use this emergency declaration. <laughs> that that's a whole nother animal uh, as it relates to this. So we'll and we'll get to that in a second. Um, so yes, I have got so many different um, answers, and I've had countless drivers call me and the the inconsistency and in interpretation um, of this declaration and and how drivers are being put out of service is is absolutely it's despicable that this far into this that that drivers are are being treated like criminals like they're doing something wrong when they're simply responding to a pandemic and it's unfortunate that I feel like that even politics and the belief in the pandemic or uh, belief in, in one min administration or another is somehow rearing its ugly head at roadside. And drivers are simply just trying to move essential goods and services. And it it's heartbreaking, honestly. Um, how many cases like know, that have I, you I, run across? Where um, you know, how many, how many of these? Uh, how many have you heard personally about? Um, is it um, beyond um, countable at this point? Since, or since the pandemic has started, I've probably worked no less than fifty cases of of drivers being stopped and and blatant misinterpretation of the declaration and the officer needed you know shown like the officer had no clue what the declaration was or the officer was misinterpreting it and 
and they were willing to accept like some mediation on on you know my part or they were completely unwilling to hear at all what I had to say and uh you know we had to resort to a data queue right, so, right. no less than 50 right well, one of them was my dad and brother well I, uh, yeah one of them was my dad and brother hauling livestock there right uh yeah um I had a driver um, got, it was uh, Utah. Yep. Got pulled over in Utah. And um, the officer said, um, is this a routine load? So we'll get to the, we'll get to the little itty bitty details here in a second. But the, the driver said, yep, this is something that we do every week. And, and the officer said, okay, well, you're out of service. That's, that's not part of the declaration. And of course he called me and um, ultimately the officer said, well, if your, uh, if your trailer had holes in it, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And I ultimately said to the officer, I said, so if that was a routine load of livestock, they wouldn't be having this conversation, but because that was a routine load of food, you're putting it out of service. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. So, I mean, it, it literally blows my mind. So misunderstood. It, it's and and ultimately, what it comes down to is there's not clear understanding from FMCSA, and there's not clear guidance and communication coming from FMCSA that's either communicated out enough, or consistently, or clearly that it's getting out to the roadside officer level. I mean, there are officers that are still pulling people over that have no idea that this thing even exists. And it just blows my mind. Right. It absolutely blows my mind. This is something that I've heard from, from the enforcement side is that, yeah, like um, if, I mean, whether the, the, the driver may consider something routine and maybe it's not routine, um, but if it's if it truly is a routine though something that's done every week um how is it and how is it qualified for um this declar for the exemption under this declaration um so something could very easily be routine but still that that shipper or, or excuse me that receiver could need what that driver has on their truck for emergency restocking. Right, right. I think the routine part that's put in there, and I think that that's kind of opening up the conversation that I want to have about some of the language that's put in here that set drivers up to not be successful. And I'll just say the words here. I'll just say them. I said them on the radio and I'll uh, the other day, and I will say them again to you. There are parts of this thing, Todd, that I, they're, they're a trap. They're a trap. Say it. I said it. I said what I said. <laughs> I feel like they're a trap. Uh, uh, what, what exactly? Okay. So, direct assistance does not include non emergency transportation of qualifying commodities or routine deliveries. All right. So, is that a new part no, of the language? No, this was put in maybe two versions ago. Okay. And Joe told me specifically, he's like, I put that language in there specifically. Like he has told me this on numerous occasions. He's like, I put that in there um, specifically. So like they made it a personal point to put that in there. And he even said, that the reason why that the changes that were made um, to this version was because they thought that there were people that were abusing it um, and specifically livestock callers. And, and one of the things that he told me is he said, we are not seeing shortages like we were at the beginning of the pandemic. And here's where I take issue with that. We're not seeing shortages because what we're doing is working. What we don't want to do 
is back off of what we're doing so we don't get to a place where we see shortages again, especially with the increase in cases that we're seeing. Like, I don't know who their economist is, but come on. Like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist here. Like, supply chain management's not difficult. So, anyway, direct assistance does not include non-emergency transportation transportation of qualifying commodities or routine commercial deliveries. Okay. So one, what is the difference between those two things? What is a, what is non-emergency transportation of quali- qualifying commodities or routine commercial deliveries? What's the difference? And who determines that? Given that there is a supporting document to this emergency declaration that says that no no documentation is required for the use of this declaration, but it could be helpful at roadside. I mean, they do, they do go on to say that, but it's not required. Ultimately, what happens is a driver is caught at roadside justifying the use of a declaration without documentation that isn't required to an officer that needs documentation to verify the use of the declaration so he doesn't put the driver out of service. Like, that's what it comes down to. Like, this is a catch-22. The driver never comes out on top here. Because of this kind of language that's in here, the driver screwed every single time. The driver should never be having these kinds of conversations at roadsides. Joe went on to tell me that he has encouraged the enforcement community to start making verifying phone calls at roadside if a driver claims that they're they're hauling a qualifying commodity in it for emergency restocking, which cool. I'm all about accountability if you need to you know make a phone call make a phone call but these kinds of conversations shouldn't be happening and and this could easily easily be avoided by what one of two ways or both by listing commodities and saying if you're hauling these things they're covered period period and if they don't want to do that require documentation they could just simply do that right it it would be simple a lot of shippers are good about about working with the carriers on that and you know making it clear on the bills lading um when you know when the when this is you know a qualifying load but uh you know time goes by um yeah things things change and i think early on in this we we were pretty uh i think the rule of thumb was for a driver um to be wary of of using that declaration unless yeah unless he was carrying some documentation that uh, that he could point to and yeah just showing that the the shipper was on board with the use of that declaration or yeah. or his carrier or who you know who he's working for or, right you know, but then SMCSA completely contradicts everything and says, but documentation's not required. Right. So, I mean, it just, it, it's always setting the driver up to fail. And it's always setting the enforcement community up to be able to write a revenue generating citation. And that's what bothers me. And you have to, I mean, uh, the words just have to be said. I mean, they, they, they just have to be said. The enforcement community has lost out on a lot of level one inspections, which have have likely led to a lot of revenue generating citations over the last 19 months. Period. Period. A lot fewer inspections being done. Yep, definitely. By putting in this ambiguous language, that allows... It's trapped! I said it thought it's a trap. (laughs) I mean, come on. This sets the driver and or the carrier up to to, no matter what they do, unless they get documentation that they're not required to have, 
even though we know that some shippers and some receivers are providing it, and even some some dispatch services are, and and that's great. Like if those things are happening, it's it, oh, and FMCSA did indicate to me that you know sometimes it's on the honor system. Well, it it, it wouldn't have to be that if you would just say these are the things that are exempt and or documentation is required. If you would just stick your balls out and say one of those things, then there wouldn't have to be any of this amb ambiguous language that would, you know, bend the driver or the carrier over every single time they were pulled over. Right. And ultimately, this is the thing that really just trips my trigger about it all. I cannot tell you how many drivers and carriers that I have talked to just since the beginning of September that have said, you know what, we're out. I'm not even going to risk it because, because this, it, it's too ambiguous now. I'm not even going to risk it. It was tough enough before because the officers, you know, acted like they didn't know about it or didn't know about it or misinterpreted it or whatever. But now I'm not even going to risk it. So there are people who are pulling out of supporting COVID-19 relief and, you know, providing, um, you know, moving, moving these essential goods and services with this added flexibility because they're not willing to take the risk with the enforcement community. Early results from our polling that I mentioned at the top showed a relative few fitting this category. About 8% of all respondents indicated they'd stopped using the exemption since its September 1st change, though most respondents had never used the exemption at all, and the sample size was relatively small as yet. I mean, like, seriously, FMCSA is discouraging people from using this because of the way that they're writing. And that is such a damn shame. Supply chain is totally, certainly a, a pretty big mess um, all around the all around the world, um, really. But um, if enough people had been using this and using it to to affect um, and stop, then you know that just gonna that's just going to um, you know put another little bit of a wrench in things and, and slow things down further. Yeah, absolutely, and and. I wouldn't, as much as I'm angry at them right now, and let me make it clear, very clear, I'm, I'm an FMCSA cheerleader. I am. I'm real angry with them right now. <laughs> but I don't want this on their hands. I don't want this to come back like, well, we would have done it. We would have done everything we could have. We would have, you know, we would have continued doing what we were doing, but you made it difficult for us. I don't want that to come back on them. Right. You know? um, so in addition to that sentence, the direct assistance does not include non-emergency transportation of qualifying commodities. Um, then there's the language to, to be eligible for the exemption, the transportation must uh, be both uh, qualifying commodity and incident to the immediate restoration of those essential supplies. Again, what the hell does that mean and who determines that? Because if you don't have something that shows that, the officer is the one that determines that. If your word against the officers, then the officer will win every stinking time. Every stinking time. Then, you, then you're just back to the, the the typical kind of data cue, um, you know, yeah, and then he said, she said sort of situation. Yeah. Right. It goes back to the issuing officer. And you'll never win. You'll never win. I mean, I, I, it would be providing documentation after the fact. And, and even then, the officer doesn't have to turn it over, even if you could provide documentation after the fact. So it's like, holy cannoli. Furthermore, here is here's another biggie. Um, this is, this is a, a big one. So the, the big things have been going from being exempt from a wide range of things to now exempt from a small thing, not being required to log and all previous versions now required to log. Um, another big thing is now required to log again, but no single 
ounce of any uh, guidance, language, FAQ, anything from FMCSA on what the expectations are. Of course, I asked. And the exact language that I got uh, from them was drivers should be logging the hours accurately and annotating. So, um, you know, that's if you're if you're if you drive for 12 hours that day, you just log as you drive 12 hours. But here's the deal. <laughs> One of the things that you can't do, well, you couldn't do this in, in any of the versions, is you can't drive ill or fatigued. Sure. Now they've got proof of how long you're driving. Now the off officer has proof, oh, you you drove for 12 hours today? He can make a judgment call on whether or not that means fatigued or not. Because he's got proof. Marx is referring there to the now non-COVID exempted 392.3 regulation, a catch-all prohibition on driving while ill or fatigued. Certainly abused in the past in some jurisdictions, regular readers may recall, by fatigue checklists and other measures aimed at quantifying it somehow to murky results. If I had to guess, I told Marx, the logging requirement is probably the biggest disincentive now to anyone thinking about using the emergency declaration, given the quote-unquote self-incrimination factor with so much roadside uncertainty. Yeah, they don't want to tell on themselves. Yeah. And here's, here's the big one, Todd. Here's the big one. This is, this is the bigger picture. And it's number six. It's about... Um, um, the reporting requirement at the end here. Yep. And I think this, the, the, the few sentences that are here are, are written in a very crafty way. And trust me, I write regulations for a living. I, I write this kind of stuff for a living. I, I can see right through this. In addition to her work with the family trucking company, Marks also plays a role in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So you notice that, um, that they wrote motor carriers that voluntary, voluntarily operate under the terms of this extension and amendment of the emergency declaration are to report within five days after the end, blah, 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 blah. You notice that they didn't write must. They wrote are. That's very key. Um, they can't write must because this is a voluntary declaration. Mm -hmm. And they didn't write must because, um, in my opinion, I don't think they want to encourage people to actually report. And here's why. I think that the trucking industry has been part of the biggest case study that uh, they have ever been a part of, ever. I think the trucking industry has, over the past 19 months, generated the data that they've always wanted and never had. Back when we were trying to justify the changes that we wanted to hours of service, uh, we never had the exact data that we wanted. We never had the exact data that we needed to justify what we wanted. But nevertheless, part of what was wanted, more flexibility, was at least garnered in the form of a revised split sleeper procedure that allowed for mid-duty period pauses of up to three hours that do not count against the driver's 14-hour clock. Yeah. Over the past 19 months, we've been generating it, but we've been too stupid to be gathering it in a meaningful way. And they know that. They know that. They know that that the validity of hours of service is going to somehow be called into question. And if we actually get our poop in a group and figure out a way to, to get this data pulled together in a meaningful way, that we might actually have something here. And this leash of hours of service that they think equals safety will really, really be called into question. So they're starting what they think um, are the steps to control that narrative. And this reporting requirement 
is is just that. They know that people are not going to go in and report because people are going to be scared to do it because they think that that's going to um, increase their likelihood of getting an audit or that's going to somehow, or maybe they were using it and they knew they weren't supposed to be, or they didn't have the documentation, but they didn't get caught or something like that. Um, So they're not going to go in and report. And what that's going to do is that's not going to generate data. And when this conversation comes up, FMCSA is going to say, well, we, we required people go in and report. And there was just such a small subset of the industry that reported their reliance on the, the declaration that your claim that hours of service, you know, not using any sort of hours of service is, is invalid or had a positive or negative impact on safety is, well, that, that argument's not valid at all because nobody used it. Our early poll results, like I said at the top, suggest otherwise. With about 25% of readers reporting some regular, if not routine, use of the exemption, another 6% reporting rare use. If you haven't taken that poll yet, find it in the post that houses this podcast at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. Andrea Marks truly believes that the COVID exemption could be hours flexibility advocates' best chance to demonstrate the safety effectiveness of more permissive drive time regulations. If only that data can be mustered. She ended with this salvo, which brings us back to some of what you heard at the beginning of the podcast, fundamentally. It's worth hearing again, though. I think this is a real opportunity for the the OIDAs and the NASICs and the, you know, the 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 trucker nations and the, you know, the, all the people, I don't, I don't even know all of them. I just can't think of them off the top of my head. But, you know, this is a real opportunity to get folks together and pool resources because getting unbiased, non-government data together and in a meaningful format in a way that can show what the last 19 months has done for safety in either a neutral or a neutral positive way, it it will literally invalidate uh, uh, hours of service as it relates to safety. It, it absolutely will. And I think we're at a really interesting time of year right now because you've got, you know, you've got PhD candidates that are looking for looking for their topic. Right. And they're looking for something to do their, you know, their research on. And we're just at a really interesting time. And if we could get somebody to pick this up, man. I, I think if we pass this up, we're passing up one of the biggest opportunities that the trucking industry's ever had. And I'm one person and I don't know where to start, but man, I'm a big dreamer and I've got really big ideas here, but I, I, I can't do it alone and I don't know where to start. You know, we, we, we also have a young secretary and Secretary Buttigieg might be somebody who wants to leave a legacy. You know, he's of a different generation than than most secretaries. Yep. And if he's somebody who wants to leave a legacy, that's somebody we, we got something you could leave a legacy on. You want to you want to devalue <laughs> hours of service and really focus on the root of the problem. And that's well trained drivers, safe drivers. Let's talk, buddy. Let's talk. Because that's where the real problem's at. And, and self-insured companies. Like, let's talk about that. Food for thought. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with additional support from Overdrive Extra contributing writer Paul Marhofer, Overdrive News Editor Matt Cole, Social Media Coordinator Holly Young, and Executive Editor Alex Lockie. Until next time, keep it pro out there.